show you like how you could actually build something. So this next um, slide is about uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. For the sake of this, let's call it machine learning. Uh, same question as before, who here thinks they know what machine learning is? Okay. Uh, who, who thinks that they should be the ones talking about it right now, after you saw my performance on cloud? Okay, nobody, good. So we can, oh, you wanna? Uh, all right, now flip, who doesn't know what machine learning is? Okay, um, good. So, just a question, uh, when, if you remember, which you probably don't, but how did you learn your first language? If that's your first language, sure. I got two, so it's like, that I have done. Little picture books, like, no cat. No. Against the Paris. What did you say? Yeah. Yeah. It's not likely that your parents handed you a dictionary and said these are the rules and you learned. It was by uh, talking to your parents, seeing books, friends. Um, an example is the first time you saw a dog walking by. You might have been scared, happy, confused, whatever it is, and you might, your brain might have interpreted four legs, cute, scary, whatever, and your parents said, oh, that's a dog. Happened a few times and you start recognizing it's a dog. Then a cat walks by. And you might think it's a dog, but your parents say, no, it's a cat, and you learn. So what machine learning is, is basically emulating how we learn uh, through a machine. So that's um, having a machine solve a problem without giving it the pre-described uh, solution. So it, um, it creates systems that can actually get smarter over time through pattern recognition, through uh, multiple data sets and interacting, um, iterative uh, tweaking of data. And just so um, we're on the same page, there could be a lot of debate on what this means, but for the purposes of this presentation, artificial intelligence is the science of making things smarter. Uh, you could argue that cruise control in a car was artificial intelligence, and I, I believe it was be probably before my time, but uh, people were scared of that and now compare that to what you know, automated cars look like now. Um, and it, it could be, you know, obviously, uh, smarter stuff than that. Uh, machine learning is building machines that can learn. And then, we're not gonna talk about this, but you'll hear some people say neural networks. This is a type of algorithm that's used in machine learning that kind of mimics how, how the brain works, but it's a way of a computer learning about something. So the key to a successful um, uh, machine learning project, and you guys will have all this at the hackathon. So what I'll, again, my goal of this whole presentation is to give you something that you can actually use uh, on the 19th. Uh, one is a large data set. This is not 100% true. You can actually get some really good results with small data sets if you leverage a system like Google's that actually is built on a large data set. But for the most part, for a machine learning project to be successful, you need a large data set. Um, you need access to a ton of compute power, which again, the cloud has done for us, which wasn't possible uh, before. Uh, and you need powerful tools and frameworks. We talked about some of them, we'll talk about them more here, uh, as opposed to having to write programming on how to train your, computer, your machine to get smarter. And again, this is uh, why you're seeing so much of this uh, now. Uh, before it was kind of theoretical, uh, Google itself used to call it artificial intelligence, then became machine intelligence, and a lot of that went with the wave of what society thinks about it. We're hitting that point where it's very real, and I'll show you some examples uh, where it's being applied in all of our lives every day, and it's made possible by uh, cloud computing, which again, you all have access to for free um, this, uh, for this hackathon. So a couple of reasons why it's all coming to a head, not only is it cloud computing, but just to give you an idea of uh, the rate of change. The last 500 years of human knowledge in society adds up to 12 exabytes of data. All our books, all our knowledge, religion, photos, anything you could think of, that's it. 
in the last 48 hours, 12 exabytes of data were created. So basically, every two days, we're taking all of human history and adding to it. And that's growing exponentially. And it's just getting more and more and more and more and more. So this explosion allows us to do really cool stuff uh, with the data. So we talked about this. There's two ways to uh, build machine learning. Uh, one is train your own data. Uh, Google has open sourced its tools. TensorFlow is a name you're going to hear a lot. We have another one called um, the, the Google uh, Machine Learning Engine. Um, and this is, tends to be used by data scientists and people who are really experts in this field. They can use these powerful tools. They can provide their own data sets. They can use our computing platform or they can put it somewhere else if they want. And they can use our tools to write the models to train their machines on their data set. The flip is to use our models. Uh, you don't need any tools, you don't need any expertise, so I'll show you how to do that. Um, and like I said, it could be large or small data sets, but you can get all the power that large tech companies have uh, inside your apps. And just to be a little more clear about what we're talking about, in the, um, the build your own, it's TensorFlow and the machine learning engine. Again, all the same tools we use, this one's open source, it's actually uh, the most popular uh, open source AI project on GitHub. So Google you know, created it, but what's being created by people at hackathons and communities and stuff is amazing. Or you can use our tools. So uh, Vision API, you give it a photo and it'll tell you that's a face. It'll tell you it's a smiling face. It can tell you who it is, just like your contacts and when you're tagging photos. Uh, speech API, speech to text. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's also, um, now that's a lot of stuff. Um, there is also a video intelligence API, but this one used to be the photos API and the vision API. It's, it's all now in one. Um, so it's built on this. So, sorry, let me, friendly machine learning. So like you can take the underlying tools and build your own machine learning um, process, or you can use the ones we've already created. So you need to use the, uh, the credits to use the ML APIs? Yeah, you can. Yeah. Or is there like a free like, set of queries you can get sent to? No, uh, the credits are as if you put your card in. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and you'll see, like, you can also use those serverless options in the next module. I'll show you how to do that, so. Um, there may be some, you can, you know, play around with it. Uh, there, there are some things, but to actually build something on it, the, the credits will get you the access to it, though. It's all part of the, the cloud platform. Do you have a user interface in front of any of the tools, or do you have to get to it through the API? We'll, we'll talk about that in the next module. Short answer is yes. So we have uh, an interface, you can use your own as well. You can you know, uh, use command line, you can use our console, you can use GitHub to deploy stuff, yeah. So like I said, um, we offer fully managed infrastructure if you wanna train your own model, so you don't wanna share the data, you wanna keep it separate, uh, you want to run the software yourself, but you still don't wanna worry about the servers. You can still run it on a fully managed uh, infrastructure. Um, TensorFlow, like I said, uh, was created by Google. Uh, it's fully open source. So here are some examples, like I said, real world cases where this is uh, in play. Search, you see it every day. If you're using an Android phone, Maps, Gmail, and a bunch of other products are all built on this exact same technology. Um, how many people use Gmail? Uh, the Gmail app on the phone. Have you guys seen the smart replies? Yeah. So it, ju it just recently came out, and this is probably old, but over 12% of, of all responses on Gmail are now using smart reply. Uh, sure. <laughs> this one? Just that it's an open source project that, you know, if you want to train your own model and you want to use the same software, 
you could go on GitHub right now and download it. Oh. Yeah. So you, you can uh, do machine learning. You can do machine learning in this. Uh, yeah. Th this is pretty like high end. Like, if you need. Uh, yeah, like if you have the skills and uh, and you can learn it, doesn't mean you can't learn it. But uh, there, there's much easier ways to do it also. So this this tool, if you've seen it, um, the first couple of times, like someone sends a email to you, it might propose a reply like "sounds good" or "sounds great," and one has an exclamation point. And you pick one or the other. Over time, it starts learning what your preferences are and how you like to respond. And it takes the context of the email plus this giant data set, and it's pretty amazing. I don't know, I, yeah, I, I, I could have full-on conversations without ever writing a word. Yeah? Uh, I have to say, what was really impressive to me, it, was, it might seem uh, ridiculous. You know, like, like if you get like an appointment, like you have like an interview or whatever, and Google will automatically pull it out and put it in your calendar. That is so useful. Yeah. I that was cool. I thought that was cool. Yeah. That was cool. And then also Duplex, who, where they have yeah. the robot talking to people and they can't yeah. even tell. Ah, oh, that's, that's Turing test level <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Would you call it? Would you call it Turing level test? Uh, yeah, you know, Turing test. Yeah. I mean, they couldn't even tell. Yeah. Could they? I mean, oh, that's cool. No. I, I just say that uh, one of the more popular projects that are developed at Space Apps Challenge are ones in which use open NASA API satellite data to read some sort of uh, weather event and then communicate that to people on the ground using AI and uh, 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 like speech to text, any kind of these uh, APIs where it turns some sort of data point into readable English and you don't need to actually have a person in the middle and so you can just send out these messages, now, broadcast that. Right? And what I'm hoping, again, this is my first space app, so I'm super excited about it, um, is that I, what you see different this year is that teams that aren't made up of computer scientists and data scientists can actually, because the, the inputs you give them allow that. So the tools we're gonna go in the next module should allow kind of any team to develop applications where you don't have to worry about nuts and bolts stuff where you can actually take the input and spit something out. Yeah. Um, so, so basically you're saying that the way to go APIs are really going to be the way to go, unless something else is going to super. I think so. Again, I, I've done three startups. I do have a technical background. I studied computer science. I had a CTO um, co-founder in every one of my startups, but I got very heavy in the cloud stuff, and I don't think I would ever n do, use uh, the concept of a server I would just get rid of. Yeah. All API, all serverless, all cloud functions. I just want to reiterate something. In terms of security, actually, that action might even be better, because no. then you can put another yeah. Gate so I mean, in, in that previous slide, what, what, like I kind of glossed over it, but security at Google is at every layer. And I, I shouldn't say other clouds, I'm sure they have it too, but again, for us, um, it's down to the CPU, like the actual physical chip, up to user permissions and stuff like that, and everything in between, so all the APIs and all that, that stuff. That has to be the way to go yeah. anymore. Thank you. Yeah. And that same smart compose exists in Gmail, which is a little different. It's not the pre-canned, uh, all those that exist. It will actually start to finish your sentences for you. Hit tab and it'll do it. And same thing, like if you have an appointment, it starts tying in other data sets. And it can, again, it just gets smarter and smarter over time. What? Yeah. Yeah. The translate app, oh, yeah. In this uh, NLP program, uh, is the prediction based on your email, previous email, or on the email of general average people? Both. Both. So it's, so like, it, it's based on a lot of things. So it's actually based on the context of the person who sent you the email, plus your overall, overall information. Plus, the machine itself is smarter on language from the overall data set. It's not taking someone else's email and saying, oh, that person likes this place, so he might like it. It's not, you know. Okay, is that? Yeah, but it, the machine itself is getting smarter because it's billions and billions of emails per second that are, you know, passing through the system. But also, as you are using it, when you tab, when you don't, when you're selecting, it starts to understand your preferences. Yeah, because maybe yeah. it's pre-trained by the other email and 
after training. Your previous email, yeah, of course. So like, again, that same thing, if you're someone that uses exclamation points or smileys or whatever, it's not gonna keep proposing that to you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So has anyone used the Translate app? The, the visual API or the actual text? And this actually combines both, but yeah, it's pretty amazing. You go to another country with a completely different script. This is showing the opposite English to something else, but uh, uh, you can just hold up your phone and it'll translate a sign in real time, a menu. It's, it's incredible. So I use um, a thing called Web Captioner, which is, uses the Google Translate API to run captions on streams. And in fact, it's something I haven't talked to Joseph about, but we may use it to, if we've got a separate monitor that will run it to use to caption the presentations live yeah. at, at the Space Apps. Yeah, and, and this is, the reason I put this one in here is it, it's a combination of multiple of these APIs. And again, I'll show you in the next module. You can tie all these together. Um, give it a video or a photo and it can print it out to text, translate it, identify signs and logos in the image in each frame and output it however you want. Hello. Cool. Uh, I lived in uh, China in uh, 2014, and I couldn't live without yeah. this. That was and the first first time I tried it. Also, was in China, <laughs> and it was yeah. amazing. Like it was my best friend. Yeah. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah. And again, these these things seem like magic, and what we'll talk about, they're not magic. Uh, and and where they would be magic is you know multi-billion and trillion-dollar companies can do all this, but now any of us can. Uh, so th this is some of those um, services, like I said, all the way on the other end. Some of this is repetitive, though. You can do it all on your own, uh, manage your machines, run the code. Uh, you don't even have to do it on Google Cloud, um, all the way to these pre-trained, easy-to-use APIs, which I'll show you how to do that, um, and then somewhere in between. I'm going to focus most of the next talk on this easy, flexible stuff with the assumption that you, know, you only have a limited amount of time at the hackathon you're gonna get this information, how you can get up and running before the hackathon even starts, and then just work on your application or system then. Um, so just again, traditional uh, machine learning historically has required a lot of assembly. You know, you gotta get the data, you gotta do all this stuff, and then it makes some sort of prediction. Uh, everything that we've done is basically get rid of that for you. Uh, just take what comes in and it'll spit out something that you can do something really cool with. So, are we machine learning ready for this weekend? The biggest uh, uh, thing to ask yourself is, is the problem you're trying to solve, does it really need machine learning? Uh, you see this across the board with startups for anything. We're an AI company, we're a machine learning company, we're a blockchain company. The first question is why do you need that tech or is it just cool to say that tech? You know. Is the problem you're solving, does it really require it? So I can give an example. Um, if the weather's, sorry, if it's 78 degrees outside, put the AC on. That doesn't need machine learning, right? That's a simple, you know, yeah. However, if it's a um, uh, high risk pregnancy ward and everything from the, the week that the, the woman is uh, in labor to uh, the, the, her heart rate to the weather outside to whatever, adjust uh, the temperature of the room, and it can actually reduce um, early term pregnancy. I'm making all this up, but that's something where you want the machines to get smarter and you want it to apply those uh, rules. Um, you want good quality data. Um, high volume completeness uh, is important. Uh, like I said, there are examples where with something like 11 data points, you can actually, using the, the the friendly AI stuff, you can get some really good stuff out of it. Um, that's because of all the other information Google has. One thing to note though is even with um, technically sound data, if, you, um, if the data set is flawed, the computer is not gonna make it any smarter. So an example uh, that I like is um, if you take all the famous scientists and entrepreneurs in the world and feed it into a computer, the computer is gonna tell you that every famous uh, entrepreneur in science of the future is gonna be some rich white male. And that's obviously not true, but that's the systems we have. 
And if you look at uh, certain terms that are high flags for um, toxicity in chat rooms, certain words that shouldn't be negative have a negative connotation because the history of our vocabulary has put a negative bias on it. So just, just so you know, as smart as the computers are, they're really dumb. They don't have any human sense. Um, and then skills, uh, depending, knowing where your skills are. If you are a data scientist, if you are a software developer and you can take TensorFlow and run the machines, awesome. If you're not and your problem doesn't require that kind of lift and it's just gonna slow you down, I wouldn't recommend going that angle. You can get all the power, if not more, without uh, getting down to the nuts and bolts. So again, this is again that same spectrum of uh, flexibility. You can use the simple stuff, cloud-based or mobile, and I'll show you how to do it. It can be a simple uh, uh, Node.js or HTTP call uh, using JSON, and you can create some really powerful stuff uh, all the way down to developing your own models and training your machines. And like I said, the first rule of machine learning is if you don't have to uh, build a model, don't. Any questions on machine learning before we move to the next module? I got a question. So you mentioned that there's uh, pre-trained data sets. Uh, hackathons passed. Uh, we get people who, you know, not just space apps, but a lot of hackathons I've been to, uh, people want to use machine learning and they start building their data sets or they start feeding their data sets like halfway through the hackathon. They don't really have a predictive model ready to go by the time uh, the hackathon's done. Yeah. Uh, what kind of lead up time do you think people would need uh, in order to train their, their algorithms? And yeah, so, so it, it also depends on what you're doing, right? So you gave an example of satellite imagery, um, you might want to, you know, um, there's one example of is it snow or clouds, which is actually a really hard problem to solve. Uh, there's a lot of data already in the system, so someone wouldn't have to train uh, um, a model with that data set. Um, identifying patterns and things in data sets you can feed into this uh, that are really good. I would, I would say the uh, the only thing where you'd want lead time, and I don't think anyone here will have lead time though, right? They get, do they have access to data now or they get it that day? Uh, so everybody has access to the challenges right now. There's nothing stopping us from work, you guys, nothing stopping you guys from working on anything. We just try to have everybody start at the same time just for fairness, but you know, yeah. start ahead of time. Yeah, I mean, more lead time the better. Uh, again, depending on which, where you're starting. Uh, if you're using the, the easy ML stuff, then none. Just, you know, you feed it a picture and it'll, it'll give you some information. Um, if, you're, if it's something completely new, then, yeah, it, it takes a lot of compute power depending on the si size of the data set. So, and I'm assuming you're not going to get it right the first time, so days at least. Uh, I'm sorry, my question is for you actually. Wait, where are the. <laughs> Random. Where are, the, where are the challenges? We can actually see the challenges right now. Sure, yeah, so I'll, I'll talk more about this uh, after the talk, but the challenges are posted online. There's about 20 of them. Uh, during the uh, October 19th uh, at the Lower East Side Girls Club, we'll go over all the challenges with scientists talking about them and uh, give you some the context we're talking about here, machine learning, of understanding what these data sets mean. Uh, we'll go over all that with the challenges so that you can figure out the best way to apply these tools to solve these problems. The, uh, this whole talk is being recorded. It's being uploaded to YouTube. Uh, October 19th will be recorded, uh, recorded too. We do encourage everybody who's going to that con to attend the October 19th event. We will give more information about that later. Yeah, just if you look at the categories, the categories have been up for a while. You click on the categories now and the challenges are under them. So if you've seen the page with the categories, which are very, very broad, there are like three or four under each one. I'm gonna suggest we just power through the last one and then we can use the rest of the time to network and hang out. Um, so like I said, what I, what I wanted to do is end this with something practical uh, that you can um, start working on now or at the hackathon. Um, so I'm going to try to show you the tools uh, that you can use immediately to get started 
and, and build something. We're not going to go too much. It's not interactive. Like It's not going to be a how-to, but it should, it should give you an overview of, of the, the pieces you'll need. Um, so does, does anybody here know what Firebase is? Oh, wow. R like, better than me, which I don't know it that well. So, uh, I, who, who has no idea what fi fi Firebase is? Uh, so I, I didn't know either before. It's, um, it's Google's mobile platform. Uh, so it's, it's a, you can think of it as an SDK, uh, software development kit that you can plug into your system uh, to easily uh, develop apps without um, worrying about normal uh, features that people expect uh, that you would have had to build yourself uh, a few years ago. So I can give a couple of examples, uh, like running on Android and iOS and having similar experiences, uh, sending a message from you know, iOS to Android to web, or whatever you're doing, uploading a photo, deleting a photo, putting a filter on a photo, all these things that again are highly technical, but all this stuff comes out of the box. And then uh, analytics as well. So everything that people are doing, you don't have to actually build your own analytics. You'll get all that information. Login, authentication, again, each of these are huge technical problems, but this all comes built in. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Uh, well, we'll talk about a couple of other cases where that matters. Uh, but I will, uh, I'll give you my favorite example, which it hurt me a lot in a lot of our, in my startups. We live in New York City. You're uploading a photo, you go into the subway, and the internet drops, and then that delivery fails. You know, back a few years ago, if you were using apps, it would just be gone. You wouldn't even know. Handling that type of asynchronous connectivity comes out of the box with stuff like that, where these are problems that you might not even think exist for some of your users, but again, uh, Firebase is taking care of all that. It still drops. It still drops, but at least it tells you not delivered. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but some, some apps are pretty good, though. Some will pick up. I think Gmail has gotten really good at that. It'll keep cir circling, and then once you get back on activity, it'll send it. But, um, so we, we're going to talk a lot about this concept of serverless. So what I'm doing in this presentation is combining Firebase, which will allow you to quickly deploy apps, meaning like you could put one up right now and have something uh, ready to go uh, in no time. Firebase plus this concept of a serverless solution. So we talked about cloud computing and machine learning in theory, this concept of virtual machines and a computer getting smart on data set. Like I said, you don't need to worry about any of that. It's all taken care of. Uh, serverless takes it to a next level. You don't need to actually worry about a machine. So there's no concept of I'm going to provision a, a Linux machine with this much RAM and all that stuff. Uh, you don't have to manage servers. Um, and you only pay for what you use, which means a lot uh, when it comes to serverless. Serverless uh, computing is basically like on-demand functions. You need the computer to do something, but only when someone needs it done. So you the Sorry. Yeah, I'm, Sorry. I'm trying to kind of, is this something you have to download if it's serverless? serverless? So, is it something you can download? So you don't even have to. So there, there is a server, there is stuff that happens, but these are APIs. So you, you would get in, you'd create your app on Firebase, and, and, I, and I'll show you what these triggers and functions mean. But for example, one of the, your users have to upload an app, right? Okay. Within Firebase, you can tell it, okay, upload the app. The serverless function call will be, there's an, uh, sorry, there's a, upload the photo, there's a photo coming stored in a database. Ah, so you're really using the app in order to get, this is the gateway to using this. So it's the overall system. It's the code that's in the app. It's the code that's in the back end, the code that's running on Google Cloud. Okay, so that's the back end enabling all yeah, the connection. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. So you can think of this also back end as a service and just all these things that, yeah. And the pay for what you use, again, is you don't have a server running all the time. It literally only runs when that function is called, yeah. I, I think this is the future by, by far. Um, so we talked about um, these cloud functions, again, no server management, automatic scaling, both up and down. Let's say you launch an app that weekend and it's a hit, you don't have to worry about it going down. Uh, and then if it's not a hit, you're not paying for you know, servers for no reason. So we, I think the most important, important piece is these, this concept of a trigger. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about it, but again, that trigger can come from anywhere. It can come from a user action. It can come from some sort of listener you create when something changes in the database. Um, 
or there's some other external event and you want to notify people about it. Uh, all these are events that you can create that can call a function or a combination of functions. So for example, I'm, I'm making up an app, theoretical app, someone um, takes a picture of a sign and they want to, trans in another country, and they want to translate it for something, not for their immediate use. The app can take that picture, use the, the Vision API to identify the sign, feed it to the Translate API, to actually translate it, and use a speech to text to speak it to someone. Let's say that was the purpose of the app. The purpose of the app is for the visually impaired. So one traveler can do it. All that stuff can be done now through a serverless solution, and we'll talk about it. And again, someone had asked, how do you, how do you deploy this? Um, there's three simple ways. There's the cloud console, where when you sign up for the credits, you'll see. It's, it's a beautiful interface. Um, there is the command line, uh, so you can literally go in and uh, just like you would with, with uh, any sort of operating system, and then if you use GitHub or any uh, source code repository through your uh, commands through that, you can deploy code directly to it. Um, good question. I don't know. I'll find out. I'll find out before we leave. But I don't think so. Um, so again, this is just an example. Uh, again, I don't want to get too technical for but those of you who are technical in Node, um, you can write a function and it will spit out what you expect it to spit out. But again, just even not that long ago, you would have had to set up a server to listen for that? Um, I just have a quick question, because the few lines of code, you've got HTTPS endpoint, and then you've got dynamically generated SSL, it's not a slash TSL cert. Is that not a duplication, or one of the, I thought that would be one of the same, no? Don't know. We can find out. But remember that question. Talk, talk to me about it afterwards. Um, and also we have an emulator, so even though it is serverless, you can run this on your local machine to test it out uh, and see how it works. Um, so again, we talked a little bit about this concept of uh, the functions and the triggers. Uh, it's everything from the authentication to the database, and like I said, I'll, I'll walk through a couple of architecture examples of that. Um, and the, and the cloud functions uh, plugged into Firebase allow you to deploy this app on multiple platforms uh, and create whatever, again, solution you're creating uh, without having to develop all these other pieces of the code. They come in built in uh, with this. Also storage, I don't want to go into too much detail about uh, this, but okay. So we, uh, we talked about that example. You've built an app uh, on Firebase uh, that, deploys onto an Android device or an iOS device, and your user uploads an image. It'll immediately go into storage, and you can run those functions, like we talked about that visually impaired speech-to-text translation uh, for a sign. And what'll happen is you'll give it uh, the image, uh, it will return you a URL, which is your download URL for whatever you might want to use it for display or for bookmarking or whatever, and it'll store it in real time into the database. Again, all stuff you don't really even need to worry about. That database, like we talked about, is synced um, using multiple technologies, uh, so across devices, across platforms, with or without connectivity. And then this is an example in the reverse that we talked about. So now in this scenario that we made up, you are the person um, you're the visually impaired person that is uh, awaiting the sign to be notified. Uh, someone has made some changes uh, or, or uploaded a sign, um, and it has been translated, and the trigger might be either the user uploaded it or some new translation came out. And in the functions, you could tell it to notify whoever is listening for that specific topic. Um, the new voice access that you've now brought out to Google has, can also do all of this. Yeah. Yeah, okay, great, fantastic. Yeah, so also, anything that you see in the, I didn't talk about the Assistant at all, but if anyone uses Google Assistant, that's all, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a very good point. There's another, uh, so 
software that we're not going to talk about today, but you could use it. Um, it's called Dialogflow. So which basically, without writing code, you can explain to an assistant how to communicate uh, with, the, with the user. And again, that, that messaging that we talked about, um, two different users, uh, different user groups, different triggers that cause that messaging, that's all baked in. You don't really have to learn anything about it, and it's a cross-platform. These are things that um, can cause headaches for developers. And like I said, for your app on the weekend of the hackathon, you can actually have all these bells and whistles that are gonna make it look that much more, are gonna make it that much more powerful, which maybe a year ago or a few years ago, you would have had to know how to code that stuff. And remember, you don't actually have to make it work, you just have to make it seem like it's working for the <laughs> demos. So, keep that in mind. Wow. Make it work, make it work, but just. So, so the whole point is with these tools, it will be a lot more workable than you think it's gonna be. Yeah, I wanted to point mm -hmm. out at some point that this solves one of the biggest problems with hackathons, which is you start hacking on Saturday morning, and then you fiddle with the infrastructure, getting your servers set up and configured, and learning what uh, you know different tools are, and then by the time Sunday rolls around, now you start putting your like IP into the actual project. You want to get this out of the way as soon as possible. Hit the ground running, start Saturday morning, just working on your app, and then deploy it, and not have to worry about any of this stuff. Because this stuff is really what comes to bite you when demo time comes around. Something wiring doesn't work. This is what's yeah. going to fix that. So, so to that point, that that wiring, uh, this is just showing that you know you'll go into Firebase, you'll create all the pieces you want, and you deploy it with you know one command, and uh, you'll be up and running. Um, that wiring stuff you don't have to worry about, um, and this is something you can get started messing around with before. Uh, just to learn how Firebase, but even if you start that day, it's, it's, it's a pretty good interface. The other thing I would recommend with any of this stuff is go on YouTube. Uh, there's a bunch of documentation, you can learn from it, but like the community has created all this stuff to show you how to knock this stuff out. If you can do it before the hackathon, awesome. If you do it at the hackathon, uh, there are people that have created incredible things, like young high school students um, that have created like cancer detection, uh, 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 platforms using TensorFlow and Firebase, which is incredible, that like no one would have ever thought of. And then also, uh, someone was asking about analytics before. So Google Analytics is tied into um, Firebase, so everything you're doing, a, a lot of things, that's a, a lot of times startups will create an app, launch it, people will start using it, and, and analytics will be an afterthought. They'll be like, oh, we don't even know what's working, what's not, all that stuff is baked in here, so you'll get detailed reports on uh, which interfaces, which buttons are working best for your app. And then Firebase predictions, this is again, built into the system. If you're doing anything with, the, uh, with media, data, text, voice, uh, using the, the, the functions or not, the fact that it's built into this system, you get the access of, uh, to face Firebase predictions, which is essentially machine learning that you can then deploy to different user bases, uh, user base and user groups. Um, for example, in that uh, hypothetical situation, the people who, are, who aren't visually impaired who are taking the photos with the ones who are using the speech to text, there can be different predictions for each group based on who travels to which location more, who needs certain signs, more than that. And even if you don't use it, but you start building your app and you're putting the data in, you have access to go back and do all this stuff. It's not like an afterthought. It is with K-Means, right? Say it again? K-Means, sorry. Uh, it's basically clustering algorithm, K-Means, right? Are you familiar? Uh, no, I'm not. Oh, that's cool. Oh, no, sorry. No. Well, you can explain it. Uh, like, like uh, it's a clustering algorithm. K-Means is clustering. It's unsupervised learning where basically, you know, you give the computer a bunch of data, you say, well, find a, a Groups you specify Pattern, yeah. how many groups you know, and then it looks for the groups and tells you what it sees. Tells it tells you what it sees, basically. Yeah. So, cool. And, and that, that's it for the overall presentation. So again, the, the goal was to thank you. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't looking for that, but uh, uh, the goal was to kind of give you a high level vocabulary and then actual tools that you can use for the hackathon. So if you have any questions, uh, we can definitely field them now uh, about. Firebase or Google Cloud or ML. Do we have any questions?
Is there like a, a simple tutorial or like just doc documentation on, because the image really caught my attention. I'm like I can build a simple like web application, feed an image with like an upload um, function. Yeah. And then just um, use, um, I guess Google's machine learning to just like generate some tags or like identify key things in the photo colors red, blue, yeah. whatever, um, the shape is a circle, something like that. And then I can do the dirty work of like pulling out the important stuff. So, sorry, what was the question? Is there documentation? Is there like, yeah, documentation. Yeah. Just like so a simple a, a, Yeah, a good start. place to start is cloud.google.com. That'll free, will get you the, the $300 in credits. Uh, but um, it's a good place to start to see all the available products that you have. And then in, for each, there's detailed documentation. But like I said, I, I would just check on YouTube, and I think you'll find some like pretty like knowledgeable people, both from Google and from the community, that might have the exact answer that you're looking for. For sure. Thank you. I was under the impression that uh, you could only, you could use Firebase just for temporary data storage, but I didn't know that you could deploy your apps. Yeah. Firebase. Yeah. You you can do both. Um, you can use it for temporary storage, even long-term storage. You can uh, use it as a full mobile platform. I have a couple of logistical questions. Um, can you integrate the messaging with another program like HubSpot or Salesforce? Uh, interesting. I, I don't know the answer off the top of my hand. I'll, I'll check, but um, I guess would be yes, but I, I don't know. Okay. And, and, and even if it's not out of the box, someone must have had that problem before. And, and my other question is, is it best to sign up for the credits with an existing AdWords or Google Analytics account, or is it something that's shareable with your team members? It's different. Uh, so the Google Cloud Console, it'll probably use the same Google login, but it'll be a different account. So your AdWords account and your analytics account are not your cloud account. But you can connect them? I'm sure you can connect them from a data standpoint. Got it. So all your analytics information, that can be, we didn't talk about um, some of the other services we have, but you can pump in data from, so this might answer the previous question also, uh, from obviously any of Google's tools like analytics and AdWords uh, and a bunch of third party tools. And it's this product called PubSub, which is a way to um, stream data or get data in batches and have different parts of your system listen in and notify you when something changes or based on whatever rules your application might have. And can I share at least the platform views or the dashboard views with team members? Yeah. Or do they each have to have their own account? Um, they probably need their own login right. account. But it would be like, so for example, when you sign up for the credits, uh, if you already have a cloud account, it's going to ask you for your billing account. If you don't, you'll create one, and you'll get a billing account, which is your company or your team's yeah. account. OK, thank you. Hmm. Sorry. Given that most of us have all Gmail and that uh, Google Drive is, is really the cloud, is that the account they're going to ask for? Sorry, what's the question again? When, given I said that Google Drive is a cloud account, basically. It, it, it's not, it's not the same. It's not the same. So this is okay. for uh, like cloud computing. Um, it wouldn't count towards your personal like drive or, okay. or your enterprise uh, um, uh, fees for Gmail or Drive or stuff like that. So this is something totally separate if you sign up for these credits? Yeah, you, you wouldn't be able to apply these Oh, to, you can't associate it with the Gmail account? No? no, so you can think of it as a consumer cloud and then the, the developer cloud. Uh, so if your app is using stuff and storing on this, yes, those credits count towards that. But if you're putting files or... It's the same for Google account. It's just like a different... Billing? Billing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Got it. Thanks. You could think of it like these are a bunch of different products that have their own account. You could use the same Google login to access those accounts, but they are separate accounts, and you can yeah. share data between them. Now, if, you, if you're eligible for the startup account, there are some credits uh, and some perks of that where you get some Gmail accounts, you get some discounts on stuff, uh, but that's really for startups. Uh, can we export the machine learning model for offline use? Uh, I believe so. Um, I think it depends, though, on which uh, level you go at. My, my, I don't know, but my guess is on the, the easy to use stuff, probably not, because you're just using the function and it's using an already model, a trained model. Definitely, if you're using um, the, the auto ML or if, if you're just taking TensorFlow off, off GitHub, yeah, you can absolutely do it. 